2 Thessalonians, you may be seated, chapter 1, as we talk about rehearsal for heaven. The Apostle Paul, of course, is <clears throat> the writer, and we'll begin in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's, let's stop there a second. Now, we're not going to be in any hurry in these studies of uh, the Bible, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Just think about this now, grace unto you. Nobody deserves grace. Do you believe that? Not a one of us deserve grace. We're sinners, sinners, and we've got to be saved by grace. You're not going to be saved by works. You're not going to be, but you're going to be saved by grace. Now, Paul is writing here, and he's talking to Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians. Watch this now. In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The people Paul was ministering to, they were in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That can be said about you. That can be said about me. Isn't that a great thing? Now think with me about this. Look at me for a second now. Think with me about this. Next Wednesday evening, if things continue the way they normally are, next Sunday morning, Sunday night, I want you to be praying that when you go through that door tonight and then you come back in, I want you to go out and coming in thinking about lost souls and how you can reach them in some way. You know, I watch people come in church and they're having a good time and fellowshipping. Great. We, we need that, don't we? We need that. But we also need to be soul conscious. Soul conscious. Now, you don't want to do anything that will disturb or, or run people away or make people mad. You don't want to do any of that. You want to be godly and spiritual, spiritually and, and spiritual led. And uh, so here's Paul, the author. And he's talking to some people that he loves, Silvanus, Timotheus, and the church of the Thessalonians. And I, I think if you could have heard Paul say this, there was probably a quiver in his throat, probably a tear in his eye when he was remembering these people that he had ministered to. When I think of uh, G.N. Francis, I'm, I get mystified. That's my first pastor and then Brother Estes, and then my deacons that I had that were godly men. When I think about them, I think about I want to see them one day. I want to see them. But I want to go to that place and have some people that I led to the Lord. And they'll come to me, and I'll go to them. Now, we ought to start thinking like that. I don't know. It may be tonight we'll go home. It may be tonight. Could be a week from now. We'll go home. But how many of us, and I'm putting myself into this, how many of us Christians will get through the rapture and get into heaven and all of that and so forth and so on? How many men, how many women, how many young people will come looking for you? They'll come looking for you. Where is my pastor? There he is. Where's my deacon? There he is. What about my Sunday school superintendent? Why, here she comes with her husband. There's going to be tears in heaven. Tears of joy. Amen? Amen. Well, you're going to see your father and your mother, sisters and brothers. I don't have any sisters and brothers, but I have a mom and a dad and a grandmother and so forth. So when I see them, I'm going to weep to see them, hug their neck. But I want to have some people that I've led to the Lord. And I know you do too. And so just one verse here, written by the Apostle Paul. You know, folks say, I don't get much out of the Bible. Well, baloney. That's an old Tennessee slang word. That's just a bunch of baloney is what it is. Watch this again. Paul and Silvanus, Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful. 
grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God and your patience and faith in all your persecutions, tribulations that you endure. Now please forgive me for just a second. I read those verses and as I read those verses, a lot of thoughts ran through my mind. Back on my birthday, uh, Sue walked over to me and she handed my, me my phone. And she said, I want you to read that. So I picked up the phone and I went up to the top like you, like you do and I started scrolling down. And names of men and women and families that I had pastored in other states and here had sent me birthday wishes. Now some of the smart addicts had a little something mean to say to me. I'll get them. I'll get them. They're not going to get away with it. They, they think they're going to get away with it. Bobby's thought that he's going to get away with things a long time ago. and He didn't and he's not. Oh, we love you, Bob. We love you so much. But you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. There's been men and women that has made a difference in your life. And every time you think of them, you may must up in your eyes, right? Uh, you may slow down in your thought and in your, in your speaking because they're precious to you. And so I just went down that list and I said, man, I'm just... I'm just a country boy. I, I, there's nothing great about me. But I said, I sure appreciate the love that these people have shown. And I know you would have said the same thing. So he says, we're bound to give thanks always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all, see, Paul was a southerner, amen, got proof, Toward each other aboundeth. There must be a bunch of Yankees in here. I didn't have any amens at all there. We'll let that go. Oh, there are a couple sitting out there, aren't there? But wonder where they're sitting. Where would they be sitting? No, it's not my wife. Where would they be sitting? Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll leave that alone. I'm not really sure. Okay. Because I got a real mean look from the woman, not the man. But anyway, watch now. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. You know, brothers and sisters, as much as we love the Lord and as much as we give to Him and as much as the Lord blesses us, we're still going to have persecution. There's no way you can get away from it. You're going to have persecution. But just think, when we get to heaven, it'll be worth it all. Remember that old song, it'll be worth it all when we see Christ? Amen. And it will be. And so, verse 4 now. <clears throat> he says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience, faith in all your persecutions, tribulations that you endure. How many Christians do you know of that get a bunch of persecutions and they just, I can't take this and walk away. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. But this old world is a mean place, a sinful place. That's why we need one another. We need one another. I need you, and you need me. We need one another. So look, look at this again. So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Comfort and persecution now he's beginning to talk about in verse 5. Which a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God and that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. I wish I had time to just dig into every one of those verses and just dig in, but we might, we've got to move along. Verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Have you ever thought about that verse much? Seeing it as a righteous thing with God 
to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with mighty angels. God has many weapons at his hand, at his disposal. Did you know that? And I would hate to be an individual that hated Christians and persecuted them because there are some things could come their way from God that they would not like. And I just throw that out for you. Uh, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Legions and legions and legions and legions and legions of angels. And all he has to do is call them. Now you think about that. One angel, I've been studying angels. One angel is a mighty, mighty, powerful thing to contend with. Study angels. Study about the angels. They're powerful. They can be in one place and another place. You're just real quickly. And they're at God's disposal. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I had more time to spend on these verses. Uh, we don't have time now, but think about that again in verse 12, that the, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. I wonder how many Christians tonight could stand up and say, yeah, that's true of me. I can say that's true of me. I hope that could be said of you, and I hope it could be said of me. But uh, that's, a, that's a powerful verse, isn't it? Now, he begins in chapter 2 to talk about the day of the Lord and the man of sin. The day of the Lord and the man of sin. Now, I'm going to read to verse 12, and then we're going to go into our outline. At the, but we're going to take our time, as I said. I do want to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 now. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I'd like to spend some time right there. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that he is worshipped, so that he is God, setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know that withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Oh, I love this. Whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Aren't you looking forward to that? I'd like to think that we'll be watching that, and I think we will. Don't you think you'd like to see Satan or this man of sin destroyed by our Lord himself and be consumed with a spirit of fire? Verse 9, 
Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Their day is coming. And then we'll not get into this tonight, but beginning in verse 13, you'll find out that there's exhortation and instructions for the saints so they'll know how to behave themselves in these awful, terrible times. Now think with me. The Christian life is a rehearsal. It's a rehearsal for heaven. Amen? It's a rehearsal. It's a rehearsal for heaven. Our business then is to teach the people, our people, the word of God. Amen? To teach the people the word of God. And as we teach them the word of God, they'll begin to abiding and they'll be victorious and they'll be preparing themselves, preparing themselves for this great day. We're rehearsing for heaven. Will we be ready? And as we're rehearsing for heaven, the subject of heaven and its rehearsal for heaven brings to mind several changes or challenges that we're going to face. We only have time to look at the first row tonight. But that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about what we're going to need to rehearsal for until we get to heaven. Number one, the challenge of living for Christ. There's going to be that change of living for Christ. Turn to John chapter 4, will you please? The book of John chapter 4. <clears throat> we don't need to be in any hurry. We have a lot of things that I want to cover uh, concerning this. Book of John chapter I want to read verse uh, 19 through verse 24. Verse 19 through verse 24 out of John chapter 4. Now let's begin reading in verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what you know, uh, that we, we know, that we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Did you get that? And now verse 24, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now what's happening here is we're being told how we can rehearse and be ready to meet the Lord because we've lived in a such a way that it's pleasing to him and when we stand before him one by one, won't it be wonderful to hear him say with a smile on his face, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. See, we want to be challenged to meet that scene and hear the Lord say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. So it, it means, now, now, now follow along with me now, this may matter of being challenged for living for Christ, and living for Christ means worship. And that's what we do on Sunday morning, Sunday night, which Wednesday night, Wednesday night. We want to worship God, as this passage of Scripture has told us to do so. Now, I would like for you, if you would, to write down these verses that I'm giving you, and then when you go home, maybe you and your, your wife or your children uh, can sit down and go over those verses again, and just both of you, or th three or four of you, give your thoughts 
You know, I love for people to give their thoughts. And then I give my thought. And what happens is you begin to think. And then you say, oh, I haven't seen that before, but I see that now. And that makes a great big difference in your life. So the Lord wants us to worship. I don't know how to say this, but let me just give you an illustration. I don't know how many people at members of Gospel Light Baptist Church and for several years and so forth and so on. In other churches around the world and around America, uh, Baptist churches, going to churches, but how many of them really worship the Lord? And how many of them will stand before him and hear him say, well done? Now, I've thought on that again and again and again. If the Lord says to you and to me, and he looks at us, and I think he'll hold out his hand and he'll say, welcome, well done, good and faithful servant. That'd be enough, wouldn't it? But you know what he'll say? Enter in to the joy of thy Lord. And he's not kidding when he says, enter into the joy of our Lord. You're going to go to work tonight, tomorrow, or home, or wherever it is, and some way, somehow, you're going to get hurt. Before you get to heaven, relatives may hurt you and hurt you bad. They may lie about you. They may steal from you. And you found out it was a loved one a treasured loved one. And you found out that they've hidden these things from you. Now think about that. How will you react? But then when that loved one of yours stands before the Lord, now you'll be there at the judgment seat, great white judgment seat, I'm sorry. You'll be there. Those people will be there. What would it be like to look into the face of the Savior, the one that died for us? and have to give an account that you failed. You failed him, you failed your children, you failed your parents, you failed the people that you work for. And then that person, that individual, there'll be a loss of reward. Maybe it will be such a thing that the Lord can't even say, well done. He can't do that. And so I want us to think about that. And so the challenge of living for the Lord. And so we're living for him, and it means worship. And so when we come, we want to worship him. But it also means giving of ourselves, giving of ourselves. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Whew. That's two deep verses. That is two deep verses. So giving ourselves as a means of worship, living for Christ means giving of yourself, and then living for Christ means giving up your means. You may have to give up your means. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I love the Bible. I love 1 Corinthians. And so I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And when you get there, I'm sorry, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> All right, now in chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Now considering the collection for the saints. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store, as God has prospered him, that there may be no gatherings when I Come. Closing instructions here concerning greetings, and the first thing he's talking about here is the offering plate. 
the time of giving, a 10%. And many people can give far more than 10%. I'm, uh, I'm thinking of a man and wife right now that I met. I'll not talk about where, when, how, or their names or anything like that. And he, he drove a Cadillac, she drove a Cadillac. They had a mansion to live in. And people would drive by and they'd say, huh, look at that. They can, there's no way they can be Christians. And I heard that and I thought, well, boy. Well, anyway, there was a revival going on in Ray County. And so I went there. And there was that man and woman sitting there. And so um, after it was all over, while he came up to, to talk to me, he had heard about me, and I was getting ready for this and that and the other thing. And uh, he said, now, I want you to know, Bob, if you need some help, I'm, I'm here for you. And now I didn't know what to say or what to think. I, sure, I could use some help at Temple getting ready to go. Anyway, I'm going to make a long story short. That man was one of the most humble men. Same with his wife. I didn't know that they'd given away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to missionaries. He just knew how to make money. Some people need to know how to do that, don't they? But you know what he did? He didn't just throw it away. He gave it for the cause of Christ. Now, I throw that out to just simply say, there's a man that went way above and over. But you know what? If we tithe and give above the tithe, uh, God's going to do some great, great things for us. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Up on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, watch, as God hath prospered. Did you get that? As God has prospered. It didn't say as you have prospered. You see, you and I wouldn't have a penny if God didn't give us the strength to work for it. Am I right? I'm right, aren't I? And I think about that again and again and again. And then the next thing, living for Christ means separation from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. And that verse is a tremendous, tremendous verse. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 17. <clears throat> Chapter 6 and verse 17. Well, we'll do verse 18 all as well. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you be my sons and my daughters. Go back up to, go, go back to verse 14. I really wanted to go back there, but I thought I'm, I'm going to go back there. Now, here's some warnings to you and I. We need to stay away from the world. But now listen to this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk with them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now watch. Wherefore, come out from among them, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and he will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. That's some powerful verses. Amen? Powerful, powerful verses. So, we need to know what worship is, what giving ourselves is, what giving of our means is, and then this matter of separation from the world, and then the last thing I'll mention tonight, and that's witnessing. Witnessing. Now, you're not going to lead everybody to the Lord. You're not going to do that. But carry your Bible with you. Have it with you. Always asking the Lord to give you direction to get to the place that he wants you to be, to the person. And by the way, he'll lead you right there. 
If you'll let him, he'll lead you right where you need to go. He'll give you what you need to say. I've had people say, uh, I just, I can't do that. I, I just, I can't think out loud like that and, uh, and, and all of that. Well, I believe God can give us what we need, don't you? I believe he can give us what we need. Now, chapter 5, verse 18 and verse 19. Chapter 18, well, let's go back up, if you will. Uh, well, no, let's just go back up to verse uh, 16. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him and was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Now watch. Howbeit Jesus suffered him, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great a things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men marveled. They were witnessing they were witnessing. And God did some great things. Great things. Um, now, I'm going to ask myself these questions uh, just uh, before we stand and, and we're dismissed. Was there anybody last week that I was really concerned about and I prayed for them? Was there anybody last week that I knew the Lord had said to me, I want you to go witness to that person. I want you to go give that person a track. Did I go? Have you had situations where you knew that he was leading you, but you just didn't go? Or maybe somebody called you and said, this person's not saved, and I don't have what it takes. Would you go? And I've had people say yes and then not go. Well, what I'm saying is, if we're going to rehearse for heaven, we need to ask the Lord to help us to pass this first test, the challenge of living for him. The next thing we do, we'll talk about the test, the challenge of being like him. And then the last thing, the challenge of living with Christ. And we'll get into that. You can be a victorious Christian. I can be a victorious Christian. Let's stand, please, and we'll be dismissed. And let's just pray that God will lead us and he will direct us and that we'll be mightily used through this church and in this area. One more time, I want to say to you, I thank God for you. You're wonderful folk. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though some of you are pretty mean to me at times, but I just overlook it. I just overlook it. Go right on. And I just smile and, and go on. Some of you are not smiling. Before we pray, I want you to smile. There you go. All right, let's bow our head and we'll be dismissed, okay? Let's bow for a prayer. Brother Bobby, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Brother Bobby.